Let me extend a very warm welcome to you all to, to our service this morning. Uh, this is a baptism service. We'll see a, an infant baptism. And I would like uh, especially to welcome the family associated with the baptism. Some have come from a distance and uh, we're very pleased to have you with us today. Can you please increase the mic a wee bit? Okay, thanks. That's better. Uh, everyone's welcome to the hall after the morning service for a time of fellowship. Tea and coffee will be served. There will also be a fellowship in the hall this evening after the evening service, and Muriel's going to give out an update on her work in Cam uh, Cambodia. The Kirk Session's due to meet tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. That'll be in here at the Session Room, Kenneth Street. There's a summer holiday planning meeting on Tuesday at 7.30 p.m., and uh, if you can help with that, please just read the intimation. Um, that's going to be uh, on July, and from 29th July to 2nd August, the club itself. And uh, please come to the meeting if you're interested in help in any way or if you can uh, help if you think you can practically or any other way. Uh, Friday, there's the um, fellowship at the hall, the 55 plus fellowship. That's from 2.30 to 4 p.m. The speaker this time is Roddy Cunningham. Uh, please come to that as well and invite others to come. And then the services next Lord's Day and throughout the week are as indicated there. They're at the usual times. The LCEA Public Meeting, Christian Education Explained, that's commemorating 25 years since the Providence Christian School opened. That's on Friday at 7.30 p.m. Reverend Kenneth Stewart is going to give a talk. And I think I'll just leave you to read through the other items there uh, on the intimation sheet today for yourselves. Let's begin our worship now. We're singing firstly in Psalm 98. Psalm number 98, that's in the Sing Psalms version on page 129. Singing to the tune Bays of Harris. Singing verses 1 to 4 as they're marked there on page 129. Those who are visitors, we stand to sing our items of praise, uh, remain seating for the, for the prayers. Or oh, sing a new song to the Lord for wonders he has done. His right hand and his holy arm the victory have won. The Lord declared his saving work and made it to be known. To all the nations of the world his righteousness is shown. His steadfast love and faithfulness he has remembered well. The covenant he made with them, the house of Israel. That's Psalm 98, page 129. O oh, sing a new song to the Lord. Let's stand to sing. If you're able to stand.
Now let's uh, call upon the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Especially we're praying for the young ones and the children just now. O oh Lord, our God, we thank you that we can gather together here today uh, of all ages and all backgrounds, and that we come together to worship you, our God, whom we confess as our God. We give thanks, Lord, today that you have promised to be with your people when they gather together and also when they're apart. And we thank you for the many promises that we meet with in your word. And we thank you, too, for the promises that we have for our children and young people as they are brought up in the ways of the Lord. So we pray that you would bless that teaching to them and that their own lives will continue to be shaped by your truth. Bless them, we pray today, and grant to us as we wait upon you here that we may know the guidance and the, the uh, teaching of your Holy Spirit upon our hearts. Open our minds, we pray, so that we may receive your word and that we may find it applied to our own uh, lives, wherever we are and whatever our circumstances may be. So hear us, we pray now, and continue to bless us throughout this day, and pardon our many sins, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Children, we're going to see a baptism today, and a baptism uses water. It doesn't matter whether it's an infant baptism, baptism of a child as we are today, or a baptism of an adult, because we practice both in the Free Church uh, from time to time. And any time we use water for baptism, it always teaches us what baptism means, or is part of the way by which God teaches us what the meaning of baptism is. Because we're using water, you, water usually is used for various purposes, but one of the main uses for water in our homes is for washing. And when we come to wash with water, whether it's a bath or a shower or washing your hands, it actually has to do with taking away defilement or uncleanness or some contamination, something that you want to be washed away to make you clean. And it's the same spiritually. Water represents the work of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, as God, washes us from our sins when we are forgiven our sins. And in many ways, the Bible speaks about our forgiveness, God's forgiveness of our sins as washing us from our sins because our sins defile us before God. Our sins make us unclean spiritually. Therefore, we need to have them washed away. And in many places in the Psalms, for example, you'll find the psalmist praying that God would wash him and make him clean. And that's to do with our soul, with our inside, with our spiritual requirements. And baptism sets out in a way that you can see visibly something that you can't see invisibly because it's spiritual. Now, that doesn't mean that whenever we apply water in baptism, that that itself saves that person or that itself washes away our sins. Remember, it's just a symbol or a picture of what happens spiritually. When we come to Jesus and ask him to forgive our sins and we receive forgiveness, what happens is our sins are washed away. God deals with us so that we are no longer uh, standing before him, sinful and in the guilt of our sins. So today, as you see a child being baptized, I want you all, not just the children, but also the adults to ask, what does this mean for me? What does it mean that I'm seeing baptism today? Where is my own life in my relationship with God? Have my sins been forgiven? Have I come to God asking that he would forgive my sins and wash me from the defilement of my sins, because that's one of the things that marks an occasion like this. We are all participants in this uh, service and in actually in the baptism itself, not just the child being baptized and the parents. So here is an opportunity for us to examine our own lives today and ask ourselves, where am I in relation to God? What's happened to my sins? Are my sins forgiven? Have I come to Jesus? Am I relying on God for the direction that my life requires? We're going to say the Lord's Prayer then, and then we'll come to another singing. So the Lord's Prayer is on the intimation sheet there, if you want to follow it. We normally follow the Lord's Prayer as it's printed there. 
Let's all together say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing again, and this time our singing is going to be in Gaelic whenever we're together uh, without a Gaelic service, as we, as we have most Sunday mornings. We have one Gaelic singing in the combined service. So we're singing from Psalm 25. The tune is Moravia. We're singing verses 8 to 9 in Gaelic. You'll find the English translation also set out on the intimation sheet. Uh, God good and upright is the way he'll sinner show. The meek in judgment he will guide and make his path to know. So in Gaelic, the verses 8 to 9 is Mice is Jiroch, Jian and Ul. Is there an Everot, the near Lish, and the Pecky Ruy, a Yakus Gowns and Rod? Throw the Hienadonia Cune and Brehonus Kukarst. Snedonia mean a Chickish Gina Lee, Gia and Fjarst. These uh, verses then to God's praise is Mice is Jiroch, Gia and Ul. Let's turn now to read God's Word, and our reading today is from the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, and chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, you're reading the church Bibles around uh, page 186 or thereabouts. Sometimes the page numbering is different to the one I have in the pulpit. It should be around page 186, so it's Deuteronomy and it's chapter 11. We're going to read from the beginning down through to verse 21. These are words that Moses spoke to the people of Israel as they were about to enter the promised land of Canaan, 
Many of the chapters are reflections on how the Lord had dealt with them, how they had come to know the Lord as their deliverer from their bondage in Egypt, and the instructions that God had given them, and the many promises as well are, are dealt with in these chapters. So chapter 11, from the beginning, you shall therefore love the Lord your God, and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. Consider today, since I am not speaking to your children who have not known nor seen it, consider the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, his signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt to Pharaoh the king of Egypt and to all his land, and what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day, and what he did to you in the wilderness till you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, their tents, and every living thing followed them in the midst of all Israel. For your eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord that he did, you shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you to do today, that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land that you are going over to possess, and that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their offspring, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land that you are entering to take possession of it is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables, but the land that you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water by the rain from heaven, a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give the rain for your land in its season the early rain and the later rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil, and he will give grass in your fields and your life for your livestock, and you shall eat and be full. Take care lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit and you will perish quickly of the good land that the Lord is giving you. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, and when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, as long as the heavens are above the earth. And so on we pray that God will bless to us uh, the reading of that portion of his word. Let's join together once again in prayer. Almighty God, we come to you today as those who owe our lives to you, for it is in you we live and move and have our being. You have created us, you have brought us into being. You sustain us from day to day. You have appointed and marked out the day of our birth and the day of our death. And all things in between, O Lord, are under your sovereign care and control. We thank you today that you are worthy to be worshipped by us. That your worthiness is brought out for us in your word. In the many ways in which you describe yourself especially in the ways that you are so perfect and consistent in the way that you deal with your people and deal with your creation. Uh, we thank you today, O Lord, that uh, you have revealed yourself especially in the Lord Jesus Christ to us. The way of salvation that you have set in him is open for us today, Lord, through the gospel. We thank you that your word directs us to consider him who came into this world to give himself to be a ransom for his people, to deliver us from the bondage of death, so that we too, Lord, might enter into the fullness of life that you promised to all who come to trust in you. And we thank you today for the perfection of Christ's work. 
and for the way that it stands before us in your word as a work that does not need to be added to or anything taken from it. And we give thanks for, this, for his perfection in his own person, both as God and man. We thank you today, Lord, that we come to you in his name. And we thank you that we come with the promise that you will receive us in his name and for his sake. We give thanks that that promise has been addressed to your people down through the ages and is a promise that will be upheld by you to the end of time. Bless us here together, we pray. Bless to us your word and bless its teaching to us. Help us to realize, Lord, that all the things that we require to know for our life in this world are revealed to us in some way or other in your word. And while we acknowledge, O oh Lord, that your word has many uh, passages that are deep and difficult for us to understand in their entirety, we thank you that all things to do with our salvation, all things to do with the way of salvation, all things to do with the way in which we come to possess salvation are made clear and open in your word. For you call upon us to set our trust in you. You call us to, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And your promise is that we will live. O oh Lord, that we will be saved, that our sin will be forgiven, that we will be accepted and acceptable to you. Bless us then, we pray at this time. Uh, bless to us all that we endeavor to do in your name as a congregation. Help us in all our activities throughout the week, and as we anticipate these in this coming week, by your will, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless all that we do in these activities, our gatherings, our work with the children and young people. We give thanks for them again today, and ask that your blessing will be with them in Sunday school, Bible class, in Tweenies, in Kresh, and all, O oh Lord, who come to give of themselves so devotedly to leadership and to teaching, we thank you for them and pray that their work might be blessed. We pray today for those who cannot be with us. We think, Lord, of uh, many who are unable to be here through illness, who belong to us as families and belong to us as a congregation. Remember, too, we pray those who are undergoing treatment, those who are recovering from surgery. Remember those who have mental health issues. Remember those who have... Uh, suffered the loss of loved ones in recent days or even in times gone by. Lord, in all of these situations, we thank you that your grace is sufficient for us, that your promise is that uh, as we come to place our trust and confidence in you, so you will never leave us, so you'll provide for us. And we pray today that we uh, may come to you with the promise that is written for us in your word, as Paul wrote to the Philippians, that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We pray that you'd remember those with us today as visitors. We thank you for their presence here. We pray that they may know this as a time of blessing for themselves, especially those associated with the baptism. We ask, Lord, that you would be to them today uh, a means of blessing and a way of uh, showing to them again the wonder of family life as it's lived in the ways in which you set out in your word. And as we find ourselves today, Lord, as a portion of your church, bless your church throughout the world. And bless today your church in places where it is so difficult for them to meet, unlike yourselves. Well, we pray for those who are persecuted, and for those who are in, in uh, different circumstances to ours, especially in circumstances of war, of famine, of deprivation. Lord, as these things are brought before us in news reports, various ways, we pray for them. We pray that uh, your blessing, Lord, would come to bring an end to war and strife and terror. We pray that the gospel will advance and overtake the thoughts of people's hearts in enmity to one another. Grant to create peace where there is war, where there is uh, antagonism, where there is hatred. Bring about, we pray, conditions where your gospel will flourish. And we ask that that may be so throughout the whole world, and not only among ourselves as a people. Bless our leadership in the nation. Be with them, we pray, at this time. Our political leaders, the royal household. O oh Lord, all who are held out before us as having authority and places of influence in our land. Graciously protect us, Lord, from 
the evil that is so rampant in the world, and enable us in all of these things to look to you. Help us now, we pray, to continue to bless you and to wait upon you here, and pardon and cleanse us from all our sins. For Jesus' sake, amen. I'm going to sing one more passage uh, from the Psalms. This is in Psalm 119 and page 157, verses 9 to 16. Psalm 119 at verse 9, that section to the end of verse 16, the tune this time is Heron Gate. How can the young keep their life pure? By do what your word by doing what your word demands. I seek you with my heart and soul. Let me not stray from your commands. Your word I've hidden in my heart to keep me from offending you. Praise be to you, O Lord my God. Teach me your statutes firm and true. That section to the end of uh, verse uh, 16 to God's praise. Well, let's turn together for a short time this morning to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, and reading again at verse 18, we're going to consider verses 18 to 21. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, And when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, as long as the heavens are above the earth. There are many types of technology available to us now that help us in daily life, and technology itself, of course, is morally neutral, you might say. Uh, there's no sin in owning and using the likes of a smartphone. 
But technology, smartphones included, can have a profound negative moral influence on lives. They can actually have so much uh, uh, of the world's thinking fed into our souls, sometimes even imperceptibly, imperceptibly that we don't really notice what's going on. And in a recent work, an author called Jonathan Haidt, uh, H-A-I-D-T, uh, wrote a, a book called The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewi Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. Now, I haven't read that whole book, but I've seen this quotation from it, and it's as follows. He was commenting on the upsurge in the use of smartphones, particularly between 2010 and 2015, when they began to be used increasingly. And he says, this was a move that essentially migrated the social lives of Western youth onto their phones. They became the first generation in history to go through puberty with a portal in their pocket that called them away from people nearby into an alternative universe that was exciting, unstable, and unsuitable for children and adolescents. And what he meant by that uh, was that because of the proliferation of smartphones, and sadly the way that many younger children even nowadays have access to the internet through smartphones, it's calling us into an alternative universe, an alternative company of people. They're not really company, they're just digitally available to us online. But it's calling us away from the more familiar setting of the community we belong to in family and in the church that really are the community or communities that must and ought to shape our lives, especially when they are themselves guided by the truth of God. So the church and the family, church that's faithful to God, a family that is established as a Christian family on Christian lines are themselves not just alternatives to that other universe that's out there, but also a necessary bulwark against it, a necessary counter to it. We have the great privilege, friends, of the strong bonds that exist and are created and continued in a healthy gospel church that enable us to actually be set against those influences that seek uh, to be damaging spiritually and morally to ourselves as adults as well as, as our children. And all of that takes us back really to the Old Testament, of course, as well, where you find these strong bonds, these covenant bonds, these family bonds, these bonds of people spiritually united together in relationship to God, uh, so often in the Old Testament, that's how the people of Israel and their relation to God are set out for us. And you can see it here in this chapter in uh, Deuteronomy, uh, in these verses that we've read and are looking at briefly today. Obviously, these verses set out aspects of their relationship to God, of their relationship to one another, their relationship to the truth of God, to the words of God. And the promise that's given to them is that if they are faithful to these ways of God, faithful to his law, faithful to his covenant, faithful to all the way in which he would have them to live, then the promise is their days will be long in the land that God has given to them in the land of Canaan. We'll come to that point in the course of our study. It's clear that children belonged meaningfully to the covenant community of Israel in those days, and indeed on into the days of the New Testament as well, so that the church, as it comes to be the church in the New Testament, is no different. Children are not somehow or other just added onto it, but not really properly belonging to it. One of the principles underlining or underlying our, our baptism of children is that they belong to the covenant community of God, and on the basis of their parents' faith, they themselves are given, just like the Old Testament children, our, uh, the, the male children were circumcised, 
uh, uh, in, their, in their infancy, so they, because they belonged to that covenant community of Israel in their covenant relationship with God. And that same principle follows through into the practice of infant baptism, and we're not um, in any way saying that we're was special because of that. There are many churches, many denominations that don't practice infant baptism, but this is our practice. This is what has been our practice. This is continuing to be our practice because we believe it's biblical based on uh, the, the way in which God's covenant runs through Scripture in his relationship with his people. That's another subject, another big subject. But that same principle of children belonging to the church, to the visible church, the people of God visibly in the world, Underline, underlines out a practice of baptism. So what is this passage telling us today? What do we learn from this passage about these people of Israel and about ourselves as the church of God, the visible church of God in this world? Well, first of all, here are a people steeped in God's truth. A people steeped or to be steeped in God's truth. You notice what he's saying here in verse 18. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them, uh, and, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and so on. You shall lay up these words of mine. And that's emphatic in the text. These words of mine is how God put it as he was distinguishing his words from the words of anyone else, from any other types of words or teaching, he is saying, these words of mine are what you give your primary attention to. You must lay up these words of mine in your heart, the words that I'm giving you, these directions that I'm giving you, this teaching that I'm giving you, this word that's come directly from myself to you, whether it's through Moses or through any other leader such as Moses down through the ages, even the apostles as well, of course, in the New Testament, God through them was revealing his will to his people, and these words are God's authoritative word as he used these people to convey them. And so for ourselves today, this is what our Bible consists of, these words of mine, these words of God. And we are to lay them in our hearts. And it's interesting, the words lay up, uh, in, in, in the Hebrew text of the Old, Bible, of the Old Testament. Um, you shall lay up these words of mine. It's an interesting uh, phrase, that, because it's actually used in chapter 10 uh, and verse 2, if you just cast your mind back to that. He's talking there about the tablets of stone, the tablets that, uh, on which the, the Ten Commandments were written. And he said, at that time, the Lord said to me, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first and come up to me in the mount, on the mountain and make an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets that you broke. And you shall put them in the ark. Now, it's these words, put them in the ark. There's a deliberate placement a purpose and a placement in the way that they had to put the words written on the Ten Commandments in the ark. This is going back to the first time God gave them that. And this is the same word that's used here for placing the words of God in our hearts. You shall put them, you shall lay them up in your hearts. In other words, when you read your Bible, when you hear the Bible, the, the word of the gospel preached, when you're actually uh, dealing with the words of God, my words, these words of mine, we're not to treat them like any other words. We're not to treat them casually. We're not to treat them in such a way that says, well, that's okay for the moment, but I, I can actually just leave it there. We are to lay them up in our heart as deliberately, as purposefully as the, uh, the tablets of stone were placed in the ark. We are to place, we are to lay up the words of God in our hearts, the words that he's given us now in the Bible with care, with purpose, with thoughtful placement. That means when we come uh, to a, an occasion such as this, when we hear the word of God preached, um, we're to say to ourselves, I'm to say to myself, though I'm the preacher, it's still the same words have to go into my heart as well. We are to say, what is God saying here? How is, how is this meaningful to me in my life? How must I use what I'm actually seeing or hearing in these words of God? What place do they have in my thoughts? How do they fit into the way that I see the world, the way that I live in the world, the way that, the way that I go about my family life, 
You see, you shall lay them up. You shall carefully place them, thoughtfully place them, purposefully place them in your heart. And he says you shall bind them. He went on to say you shall bind them. Um, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And of course, uh, and as well as that, uh, putting them on their, on their house as well, um, on the doorposts. What he's saying by that, of course, literally that was true of the Jewish people down to the Old Testament. It's still true of them to this day, uh, that you'll find them, uh, many of them who are seriously religious at least, they'll find little phylacteries, little ways in which uh, boxes or whatever, in which the extracts from the Ten Commandments or whatever are actually set out before them. Uh, they're on their doorposts in their homes or whatever. So literally, this was going to be true of those people Moses was speaking to then. But what does this mean for ourselves? How has that got any meaning for us today? Because we don't actually hold um, a box that we tie then to our, 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 uh, our persons in such a way that contains extracts from the Word of God. Well, what it means is that we become so familiar with the Bible that we carry it into all our circumstances. You think of a Jew in the days of Moses and Jewish people then, even to this day, as they go about, those of them who are uh, carrying this out literally, well, they carry out these, they carry about these extracts with them. And what it's saying to us today is, here's your Bible. Set it up in your heart. Lay it up in your heart. But lay it up in such a way that you continually keep doing this. Become so familiar with the words of the Bible, with the teaching of the Bible, that you carry it with you into all your circumstances. As we'll see in a minute, he, he, uh, in the context of, of teaching their children was that they would be taught in the different circumstances of family life. And here we are today, some of us parents, some of us grandparents, some of us young people, some of us children. And here's what God is saying to us. This Bible is my words, these words of mine. Lay them up in your heart. Bind them to you in such a way that you're constantly, uh, you're constantly learning this word, learning what it means, becoming familiar with it. Because it gives us what's often called a moral compass to our lives. Just as a compass points all the way to the magnetic north, the ordinary compass, um, so the Bible is a spiritual compass for our lives. It will always keep us pointing in the right direction if we follow it. And for that, we need to lay it up in our hearts. We need to constantly add to our familiarity and knowledge of it. I always admire those people. I'm not one of them. But I admire those people who constantly are able to, to bring the Word of God up in their conversation, in different circumstances in life. And it's a wonderful thing when you, whether it's in a care home or in somebody's own home or whatever, when you actually come to people perhaps who have lost some of their mental faculties. And yet when you start quoting the word of God to them, they will follow you word for word, especially if it's a psalm that you're going to sing. Why is that? What's brought that about? Because they've laid the word of God up in their hearts. Because they've lived by it day by day. Because they're so familiar with it that even though their circumstances have changed, they're still drawing from the word of God words which are meaningful to them. And that's how it must be for yourselves and myself as well. Not just as individuals. We're talking today especially of God's truth at the heart of family life. That's what the title we've given to our, our, our study today is. God's truth at the, at the heart of family life. How is God's truth to be placed at the heart of family life? Well, you take it and you set it up in your own hearts. You lay it up there. You carefully place it. You thoughtfully place it. You purposefully place it in your heart. And then you carry it with you as your moral compass into the various circumstances in life because as you know very well for ourselves as adults and for our children especially there are so so many other influences pulling them in different directions from the compass of God's word and the more you have that compass of God's word the more you will sure will, will be sure that you're facing the right direction and traveling in the right direction morally and spiritually in your life. There are people steeped 
in God's truth. And we are a people who seek to be the same. We know God's word, we hear God's word, we read God's word, we lay it up in our hearts. We want to be steeped in this word. We want to use all our opportunities to actually become more and more familiar with the teaching of the Bible. I know people will say nowadays that's just old fashioned. It's completely out of date. Not if you believe this to be the word of God as we do, because God's word does not become dated. It doesn't need to be renewed. It doesn't need to be adjusted to take account of whatever the circumstances in our society are today. God's word is God's word. God doesn't change his mind. And God doesn't need to rub something out and replace it with something else. That's why it's so important to us to lay it up in our hearts today. But there are people, secondly, not only steeped in God's word, but are people who teach our children God's truth, teaching their children, so we teach our children God's truth. You see here, you shall teach it to your children. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you're sitting in your house and so on. Now, that doesn't mean that the children don't ask things. In chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, um, you'll find that uh, the children themselves are, are given the facility of asking about the meaning of the Passover and things like that. Uh, from chapter 6, verse 20, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you, then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. He showed signs and wonders, great and grievous. He brought us out from there that he might bring us into the land that he swore to give to our fathers. In other words, when our children do ask, what's the meaning of the communion? What is the Lord's Supper all about? Why do we baptize children? Why do we baptize adults? What is the meaning of that? Why do we go to church? Why are there elders in the church? What's the meaning of all of those things that we see? We explain them, or seek to explain them, in terms of what God has revealed to us. And especially when you think of the likes of baptism and the Lord's Supper, just like in the days of Israel with the Passover, they are intimately connected, inseparably connected with the things of God's salvation in Christ. And that's what we need to constantly set before the children when they ask us, they should ask, and we have to encourage them to ask. But here in chapter 11, it's actually the responsibility is laid upon the parents themselves. You shall teach them to your children. The initiative and the response there is with parents. But of course, the church fits into that context so very well. We're privileged ourselves as congregation, as many other congregations are, to have people who are dedicated to the teaching of our children in Sunday school, in Bible class, in tweenies, various other activities where the Word of God has some input into it. All of these things together form the framework in which we seek to present this teaching of the Bible along with the formal teaching of sermons and of Sunday worship and so on. Church context is a community together. That's why it's so important to think of the church as God's covenant community. There are people bound together by the truth of God. Yeah, because that's where we need to be so careful with, our, uh, with our, fr our own relationships and also our own online activities, but especially protective of our children. There are many online communities, just to use that word, but they're very different to the relationships that you have in uh, terms of, of, of physical community relationships. Online relationships, well, they're flimsy. They're sometimes not all that real. They can disappear just like that. They can be very, uh, very aggressive. They can be very uh, difficult. They can become a real burden. But the church and Christian families ought to be where bonds of love and care uh, and com compassion and help are actually available to us. Let's face it, our children today face so much peer pressure as we, as we refer to it. Pressure from their own age group. 
right through from primary school up into secondary school age, peer pressure is an enormous feature in their lives. That's why I mentioned at the beginning of our study today the influence of smartphones, because the smartphone brings that community out there online into your own presence, into your bedroom, into your living room, into your car. It's hardly any place that you get rid of it unless you're very strict about how you use it. And we have to actually watch how our children use it as well because peer approval is hugely a feature of young people's lives, um, especially when they get online and they want the approval of those that they're friends with on Facebook or whatever it is, TikTok, whatever. The approval of that community that... Uh, that community, online community, is so important to so many people today. You know, one of the great words that we find used is influencers. And I just happened to check um, on the meaning of that word. It's used a lot in terms of online communities. And people actually live lives and uh, uh, not just live lives, but actually gain income, sometimes massive income, from being an influencer. Influencers in terms of what you wear, what you eat, how you live your life, what's important, what isn't. And you know, some of these influencers, I just checked a couple of them today, one of them had 44 million followers. 44 million followers, especially if they're from a celebrity background or from the pop culture, uh, music culture, whatever. Massive, massive influence. One person with a smartphone, 44 million followers. Just imagine what that's doing to young people's minds if they don't have the benefit of God's truth to keep them, to direct them. That's why the author I quoted at the beginning said, they're the first generation that carry a portal in their pockets through which they have so much influence coming into their lives from influence. I'm not saying there's not good influence. Of course there is. There's much good influence. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a whole lot of bad influence as well, both for adults and for children. And that's where influencers in the church setting, influencers in the family setting are so crucial to offset all that influence that you find online and whatever else it is in the world. Because the influence in the church bonds of friendship and of family bonds, the influencers that come to take their stand in God's truth, and that's their point of departure, that's the kind of influencer that you want to be and that you want to have uh, influencing your life as well as mine. The most important influence in my life and in many other people's lives here were people who loved the Lord, people who showed me the ways of God, People who told me that the influence of the world, though I didn't want to know it at the time, was harmful, was not the thing that you, used, that you should follow in life. But when I came to know God, and when I came to know the ways of God's truth, then the influencers, these Christian people, these mature Christian leaders, they're the influencers that really shaped my life. And that's why I thank God to this day that there are influencers in the church of God and God's families in the world, families that are Christian families. That's the influence our children need. That's why it's important having children belonging to the church, coming to be influenced properly, morally and spiritually by those whose conviction is that this is the word of God. I need to lay it up in my heart I need to convey it meaningfully and lovingly to my children, to my grandchildren, and so on. And you see, the teaching context he gives us here is important, just, just uh, before we come to wind up. If he says here, uh, there are five elements, really, that he mentions here, aren't there? He says, you shall teach them to your children, talking of them, when you are sitting in your house, that's one. When you're walking by the way, that's two. When you lie down, that's three. When you rise, that's four. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You see, he's saying there, when you're sitting in your house, in other words, at mealtimes, 
And uh, I remember when I was involved with church camps a number of years ago now, but surprising even then the number of children that were never actually familiar with sitting round a table at a family meal. They were given something to eat, they went off and they just sat in front of the telly and ate it there. Never used to actually sitting together round a family table, round a family meal. Never used to having grace said before meals. And so many in the world, sadly, are like that. So many in our own community around us are like that. But here is the alternative to that. Here is the counter to that. You shall teach, you shall speak of these things, you shall teach them to your children, talking of them while you are sitting in your house. How many of us today, especially if we have children down at our table, while we're having the meal, are going to talk about spiritual things, about Jesus, about the love of God, about something or other that comes from the Bible? This is what he's saying to us here. Teaching them when you're sitting down and also when you're walking by the way, when you're actually going on holiday, when you're traveling, when you're going from one place to another, he's saying, you shall teach your children these things when you're doing that. In other words, when you go on holiday, you don't leave your Bible at home. You don't leave the Bible's teaching behind your closed doors at home. You take it with you. You teach your children even when you're walking on the way, when you're traveling on the way. When you lie down, when you rise up, the two points of the day, when we wake and when we go to sleep. Everything in between too, of course, but it's important when we wake up that our thoughts are upon God's word, upon God himself, that when we go to end the day that we're thinking of God, how good he's been to us that day, what we've learned from him that day. In other words, we're talking about family worship. Family worship is in decline and has been for many years. And family worship where children, especially the younger children, are nurtured in hearing the Bible read and having it explained briefly, simply, it doesn't have to be complicated, and hearing a parent or parents pray to God. That's the context, the beginning, the end of each day. He's saying here, you shall teach them in that context. And you shall mark them on the doorposts and the gates of your house. In other words, so that your house will be distinguished as a house that fears God. Now, of course, we don't necessarily, as I said at the beginning, have something attached to our doorposts that say this is a Christian home. It's much more by way of what we do and how we're seen and how we live and how we behave. But our homes need to be marked out as belonging to God, as belonging to a people who love the Lord. And we can only do that as we follow the teachings of God's word for ourselves. So there are people who are steeped in God's truth. There are people who teach our children God's truth. And the context of teaching is really as wide as to take in all of those circumstances that's meant, that are mentioned there in verses 19 to 20. But he gives us a promise. Let me just finish with this. You shall do this so that, you, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them. Now, that doesn't mean uh, necessarily that they would live to a, a ripe old age, every one of them. Many of them died in childhood, especially in those days. It means rather that they would not be displaced from the land that God was giving them. Because being displaced from the land of Canaan was a mark of God's displeasure, a mark of God's judgment indeed. And the exile that came later on that's foretold here and, and by the prophets especially when they were taken away to Babylon for their time of captivity in Babylon for these 70 years, that was God's judgment because they had abandoned God's ways. They had actually brought a lot of pagan uh, ideology and practice into their, pra into their uh, way of life. And so to be displaced from the land was actually a mark of God's judgment. It was itself God's judgment. And what he's saying to him here is, so that your days will be long in the land, that they'll be multiplied, that you will not be displaced, uprooted from this covenant land. Do these things, and that will not happen. And so where does that fit into our experience, our circumstances today? Well, how do we come to have 
stability in family life? How do we come to have stability in a church congregational setting? How do we have stability in our individual lives? This is all about stability. Remaining in the land, stability, peace, satisfaction. Well, you come to it by laying up the words of God in your heart. That's what he's saying in verse 13, isn't it? If you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give you the rain for your land in its season. You see, this was not to be a legalistic observance of these commandments, as if to say, well, we've done that, and now God is obliged to bless us. They were going to do them out of love for God. That's where we start. That's the beginning. That's the root. Our love for the Lord, when we love him with all our heart, then the promises, you see, come into their own. The promise of stability, the promise of being kept by him, guided by him, blessed by him. We pray that God will bless to us today uh, these words. We're going to sing now some more verses. This time we're singing from Psalm number 90. Psalm number 90 to the tune Kilmarnock. And at this point, uh, others will be coming in to join the service. That's on page 350. And so we're singing from verse 14. O with thy tender mercies, Lord, as early satisfy, so we rejoice shall all our days and still be glad in thee. According as the days have been wherein we grief have had, and years wherein we ill have seen, so do thou make us glad. O let thy work and power appear thy servants' face before, and show unto their children, dear, thy glory evermore. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be us upon. Our handiworks establish thou, establish them, each one. These verses to the tune Kilmarnock, O, o with thy tender mercies, Lord. Thank you. Please be seated. 
Now we're coming to this point in the service where we're about to carry out the sacrament of baptism. And as I said previously, that's something that involves us all, not only in terms of reflecting on our own baptism, if we're baptized, and what that means in terms of our relationship with God, and especially our having our sins forgiven and being washed from the defilement of our sins. It also means that we are partaking in such a way as to be a support to those who are coming with their child to be baptized. We are, as a church, committed to support one another, to love one another, to provide for one another, to care for one another, to be watchful for each other. And that's not least in the circumstances where our children are involved. And so today, for yourselves and for myself, this is obviously a thing in which we are very closely involved. And before I come to the baptism itself, I need to ask some questions. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Mark and Emma to stand, please. Emma, I'll ask you the questions. Do you acknowledge God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, revealed in Scripture, to be the only true God and your God? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and men? Do you now promise to bring up this child in the nurture and training of the Lord? Thank you. Can I ask you all to stand, please? We're going to engage now in prayer. Lord our God, we give thanks today for the sacrament of baptism. We give thanks for all that it signifies and seals to your people. And we give thanks for the reminder in it that we ourselves are liable uh, to the death that our sins deserve. And we give thanks today that you deliver us from such when we trust in you, when we come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And we thank you today, O Lord, for the many promises that are attached to the sacrament itself and to the family life that's associated with it. We do pray today that you would grant your blessing to us as observers, participants, and especially uh, to Mark and Emma and to their children as we find ourselves today with them in this uh, happy and joyous occasion. Bless them, we pray, and bless this uh, water now as it's used for a sacred use. May it please you, O Lord, to follow its administration with the blessing of this child and the blessing of this family. Continue to watch over us and uh, continue to provide for us through the gospel. We ask it all, seeking pardon and cleansing from all our sins. For Jesus' sake, amen. You come forward now, please. Ailey, Margaret, Anne, MacLeod, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's briefly pray. Lord, we ask that you would bless Ailey now as she has received baptism, that you would bless her parents, that you would bless Alexander, that you bless them as a family, bless them in their home, and in all the things that they do together. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would continue to watch over us as a people, to continue to provide for us. And in all of these things we pray in your mercy and grace that you would receive our thanks. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go back if you want. Okay. Uh, please be seated. You can take your seat. Now, my apologies, I left out a psalm when I gave it to, the, uh, the, the, to Lizzie for the intimations and also to the presenter, so we'll sing 133. So we're going to sing Psalm 133 on page 424. Psalm 133, that's on page 424. It's a psalm that talks about the benefits of being together of being a people who are united together by the truth of God. 
and is compared to the dew that comes down on Hermon's hills and the blessing of God that he has commanded. So we'll sing uh, these three verses of the psalm. Um, we'll stand to sing after we've uh, sung the psalm. Please remain seated, seated for the benedic- uh, standing sorry, for the benediction. Behold how good a thing it is, and how becoming well together such as brethren are in unity to dwell. Let's praise God. here to my left. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen.